This is Port Stories, brought to you by the Ports Past and Present Project, sharing stories from five ports in Ireland and Wales, Dublin, Rosslare, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock, project funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. Hi, my name is Jonathan Evershed and I'm a postdoctoral researcher on the Ports Past and Present Project based at University College Cork. For this episode of the Port Stories podcast, I was delighted to be joined by Robert Law. Rob is a photographer based in Anglesey. His practice concerns documentary photography, capturing rural and urban environments and the people within them. His work focuses in particular on how humans interact with and change the world around them in ways which are often overlooked. Rob joined me to talk in particular about his ongoing photographic project, Hollyhead Sea Change, which seeks, quoting Rob's website, quote, to observe and document Hollyhead as honestly as possible, end quote. In particular, it aims to provoke a dialogue about how and why Hollyhead, Wales' busiest port, with close links to Ireland and a reliance on European trade links, voted by a sizable majority to leave the EU. Sea Change has been shortlisted for a number of awards, including for Portrait of Britain 2019, the British Photography Awards 2019, the ESPY Awards 2019, and most recently, the Urban Autica Institute Awards 2020. The project undoubtedly asks important and difficult questions about Holyhead, its past, present, and post-Brexit future but it does so with real empathy and sincerity. The muted tones of Hollyhead sea change are at times strangely haunting. In the town's sea of pebble dash, Rob finds what he describes as beauty in the banality, and his portraits evoke a strong sense of community pride and resilience. We talked about a few of the images from the collection in more depth during our interview, and these are all available to view on Rob's website, which you will find at wtgphoto.com. I'll put a link in the show notes. Also in the show notes, you'll find a link to Rob's November 2020 talk to the Royal Photographic Society about Hollyhead Sea Change, in which he talks in more depth about some of the themes and ideas we discuss in this podcast and showcases more images from the exhibition. So hi, Rob. Thanks for joining me this morning. Great to be here. Thank you very much, Jonathan. We'll get straight into it, I think. And I I, I just wondered if you could tell me a little bit about Hollyhead Sea Change, the project, and where the idea for it came from. Um, Well, I'm a documentary photographer and obviously based in North Wales, there's a lot of photography that comes out of North Wales anyway. And a lot of it is sort of landscapes and and quite rightly so, you know, people are enjoying taking pictures of beaches, lighthouses, golden sunsets, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a place also where people live, they have their struggles, we have to work for a living and um, there's a story to be told there. And that's the job of a documentary photographer. And, And I live on... Anglesey, obviously, uh, and I've documented a lot of North Wales anyway. But Hollyhead was a place that I hadn't really ventured to, uh, ventured to Jonathan. It's, a, it's literally only 30 minutes away. But like a lot of people, it's a place that's um, travelled through. It's, it's a bit of a thoroughfare. Uh, it's an unromantic, sidelined, overlooked town and community. And I decided that that deserved some attention. And so I, through convenience of it being 30 minutes down the road, I decided to concentrate on on Hollyhead for a project. It was quite interesting. I was seeing things anew for the first time, even though I say I live on Anglesey. And I think a lot of people who know this area might not be quite aware of how independently minded Anglesey is. You know, we're set off from the mainland. We're very closely connected with two bridges at all. But the the, the, the sort of mindset, the community feeling on Anglesey is quite different from that of the mainland. But then again, you've got Holyhead on Holy Island, which is an island off our island. It's joined by a causeway, well, two, two land connections. Uh, 
but it's also um, Anglesey's largest town, highest population, and really, really strong history. Quite a different mindset once you get over there. It's a, it's a very, very different feeling. It's definitely um, it's like a little republic off, off Anglesey, basically. I can view it as well as, as an outsider, uh, take a fresh view with a fresh pair of eyes. Um, I'd like to say unprejudiced, but everybody has um, preconceptions and it does inform the way you see things a little bit. But uh, I try to see it as freshly and without any bias or any without any preconceptions, I should say. I'm interested then in in what sort of story maybe it was that you sought to tell about Hollyhead through this photographic project or perhaps more probably and more appropriately what story about Hollyhead emerged for you from this photographic exploration of it well it started off as literally wandering the streets with a camera and and seeing what caught my attention and in uh, photography there's a discipline called new topographics basically it's just a fancy way of saying um of looking at how the landscape has been changed by man but in real terms it means lots of pictures of uh, wheelie bins and car parks and, and and all sorts of interesting things that, that that people like myself really like we've got a tendency to photograph the banal stuff that people might find quite boring but we like finding beauty uh in in the pebble dash and in the car parks and and, and strange things basically as well as the pretty things of course um and it started off as an exploration of the topography of Hollyhead. Um, it can, it, it, it's, it, it does have its own aesthetic. It has its own look. Uh, and specifically, there are places of the town that are completely undocumented and ignored. And the more they're ignored, the more I feel driven to actually document them and photograph them and let people see them. Like I said, plenty of people shooting all the popular places the popular scenes the, all the honeypot locations they're very very well documented so for me it's a source of documentary gold to be able to go to places that everybody else completely ignores and it is absolutely solid gold and then there was the underlying narrative then of brexit underneath all this as i started to build up a body of work of the town and that's quite an interesting aspect, of course. You know, why would a seaport with very strong connections with the EU and Ireland, why would it vote to leave that? And, and by substantial amount as well. Um, with EU investment, clearly apparent with little blue plaques dotted around the town. Why would the local population then decide that they wanted to trust Westminster from here on to uh, provide an equivalent amount of investment. So it's a bit of a paradox, but it's in common with a lot of other coastal communities, as you know, in, in Britain, they, it's following the very, very same pattern. So the Brexit narrative meant that I had, as all photographers do when telling uh, a story of place, you have to have interviews and portraits of people as well. And that was the most exciting part of working on it. And it's still ongoing. Um, that I started uh, to get into portraiture, overcoming a bit of personal trepidation and and, and uh, speaking to people and getting getting their stories and getting their pictures. And so that started to build up a really rounded picture. Uh, and although it doesn't explain uh, the paradox of leaving the, the EU, it starts to explain a sort of a feeling of being hugely overlooked, a community that's entirely overlooked, a feeling of complete frustration of being abandoned. And yeah, it, 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 it was a very, very clear picture that came um, came over again and again every time I spoke to people, whatever their age, or whatever, whatever their, their background was. I mean, I am personally fascinated in exactly that question of how and why uh, does this place with all of its apparent connections to Ireland and its apparent uh, benefiting from Britain's EU membership arrive at this position. And, and the, what you're speaking to here and what emerges from the photographic collection as, as well as the testimonies of the people that you spoke to is that sense of abandonment or of, of being marginal or 
on the edge in some way. Is that is that right? Yeah, that came through very clearly through one respondent. Uh, her name was Christine. I took a, a portrait of her in front of a terrace of houses right next to the port. And she'd lived there all of her life as, from a young girl. And she was now in, a, in a, I guess, a mid to late 60s. And I said to her, but but there's the port, there's the, there's the commerce associated with the town. And she was she was a very strong Leave voter. I said, yeah, but it's just the the wealth that goes through the port. It doesn't stay. None of it sticks. It's just a, a throughput through there and has very little bearing on her life. She feels. Um, and it was the same through th through a few people that I spoke to. They they all felt that it was a thoroughfare. Um, and I went into the town centre. There's a, one of my favourite pictures, actually, Jonathan, is a, is a picture from inside a cafe looking at a window of a sandwich shop. I just like the colours. And um, I spoke to the owner there. She told me some tourists came into the shop once um, asking where the town centre was. And she said, and her heart sank, this is the town centre. And the town itself gets very few visits from people. They will tend to offload on the uh, the train station and straight onto the ferries or from the cars into the ferries and the town itself isn't isn't particularly visited and it you know we're not talking about a better sequoid or or a, a very pretty place it, it you know it's a working port but there's there's definitely something very attractive about it that emerges from your or there's a a distinct personality that you we talked about the republic of hollyhead that emerges from your from your collection isn't there yeah we call it beauty in the banal um and it's it is a sea of of, of pebble dash as well and uh aa gill the restaurant critic um said it's uh quite quite nastily actually this is where pebble dash comes to die uh but it is everywhere and you have to embrace it and I, I did an interview once with the mayoress of Hollyhead, and she came up to me with a big, big smile on her face. You're welcome to Hollyhead, where Pebble Dash comes to die. Um, but it has its light, and its shade, and I've got some really nice, nice pictures. Um, there is one uh, estate called Peblig um, on the edge of Hollyhead, right, right by the shore, and they've actually painted the houses um, in, uh, in in a sort of a pale blue and green with a sort of I don't know if you remember or have seen in World War One they painted battleships in a sort of distress pattern with sort of angular colours to sort of break up the lines. They've done this with a with a complete estate of houses, and it's really interesting. And that's um, that's one of my favourite images actually, and that ended up uh, being awarded for the in the British Photography Awards 2019 and the Aspire Awards in Swansea in 2019. So that was a really nice nice picture. And it was just taken at dusk. I know this is a pod but if people go to the website afterwards they can see it and there's a little glow from one of the windows of the houses and the kids left a tricycle on the side of the road and it's it's just got a really nice atmosphere about it we'll definitely share a link to where people can see the photos in the in the show notes because they, they must um <laughs> thank you the back of this conversation i think I wanted to pick up on, on something you've already touched on, really, which is that obviously part of the story that the collection, uh, the exhibition tells is about the relationship between the town Hollyhead and its port. And you've already suggested something of an ambiguousness or an ambiguity to that relationship. And I wondered if if you could kind of maybe elaborate on that a bit. What What sort of story do you think uh, sea change tells about the relationship between town and port and I suppose about Hollyhead's maritime history more broadly. Yeah because one thing that came across well from my own perspective and we'll be realistic about this I lived in Anglesey nearly all my life and um, as a young man I wouldn't have gone anywhere near Hollyhead in the 70s and 80s and a lot of my friends wouldn't have either it was as most seaports are it was a tough tough place of course, now I'm in my 50s, I'm, I'm going and I'm just meeting just wonderful people. And uh, I, I want to really emphasize what a fantastic community there is in Hollyhead. I mean, they're so close, so supportive of each other. And that really shone through. It was a bit of an eye opener. Um, everybody seems to have this real pride and pride of, of a very closely cohesive, connected uh, community. There are so many efforts uh, involved with supporting each other through through the food bank, through cultural initiatives, through the, the they have the Echeldre Centre there, which is a, an art centre, really busy, really vibrant. 
so many so many little connections uh, within that community and there's this underlying maritime pride i haven't seen it anywhere else that everybody seems to know about the history of the port to some extent or their own personal family connections to it uh, and i think wartime history uh, second world war that is plays a big part in that um as well in its role uh, in world war ii so th that that's so strong um and i think everybody will know somebody who's had a, a relation that's worked on the ferries of course um and obviously a lot of local people will be employed in the port but then again there's still the feeling that yes everything's traveling through the port as i said that the wealth doesn't stick there the there is the issue of uh, employment in Hollyhead, and that has been very, very challenging for, for decades, really. And the um, one of the largest employers on Holy Island is uh, Hol uh, what is uh, uh, excuse me, Anglesey Aluminium, formerly Rio Tinto Zinc, a huge employer, a big aluminium uh, smelting plant that's now closed. There is a small part of it still opening for recycling, and there were, you know, there were promises of converting that to a biomass plant, and uh, I'm not exactly sure where. I think those plans have faltered, or I don't know if they're going to come to fruition or not. And then the other big employers, Wilver Nuclear Power Station, which is now closed, it's being decommissioned, and there was talk about Wilver B, a second plant, and that has definitely faltered, and not it's not going to happen. So quite a few hopes have been dashed and people that I spoke to a couple of years ago mentioned both those projects with hope post Brexit and they haven't materialized and so that's quite sad to see because for a young person there's not much around in Hollyhead and uh, I can't see that changing. One of the um, most striking photos for me in the collection is of a, a group of young people playing in a, in a skate park with a view of the port in the background and then beyond it, the horizon. And it, for me, it really evokes a sense of, of Holyhead being, you know, on the edge um, of Britain's political community. Um, it's closeness, you know, literally and symbolically uh, and emotionally to the sea. Um, and maybe it's distance from, you know, Westminster, from, from Brussels, from Cardiff. Um, and then the image of those young people in this space, kind of far away from the political, cultural, economic centres on the on the island of Great Britain, um, is very evocative, I think, of what you're saying, of, of Holyhead as a kind of community on the edge in some ways. And I suppose it leads me to what what might be the final question here, which is what sort of sense did you get from those that you photographed and that you spoke with over the course of this project about Hollyhead's future? Um, you know, what hopes, what fears do you think are captured in in Sea Change uh, and in in the voices of the people that you you spoke with over the course of the project? Um, there was a sense of disenfranchisement uh being forgotten and sidelined that that was clear from everybody i spoke to that they felt that they they were, were treated as if they didn't really matter that the port was being used um uh, but they weren't benefiting from it that was that was very clear and it was completely overwhelming and the the fact that they they voted brexit was to sort of elicit some sort of change it's not even that they had any clear idea of what that change would be and if it would if they benefit at all but it was a case of well things can't get any worse uh, it, we're going to try something for god's sake uh it was as clear as that jonathan and um i haven't been able to go back to hollyhead since all the brexit um measures have been enacted so we now know obviously that the hollyhead uh port is now you know, a shadow of, well, the traffic's a shadow of what it was, greatly reduced as ferries being now diverted directly to the continent. So what impact that's going to have is, uh, is certainly not going to be good. Whether that resumes back to normality in, in the near future, we, we certainly don't know. But because of the pandemic, I haven't been back and I haven't been able to talk to people and gauge any sort of feeling. Um, and the the project again it's, it was not to provide any answers it was really to sort of provide a, a perspective or a, a sort of feeling to 
sort of walk a mile in somebody else's shoes maybe just to to have a feeling of what the port looked like uh what it felt like really um and from there help people maybe um or maybe to create a dialogue uh, a bit of understanding a bit of empathy um, um not to provide answers but just to provide a maybe maybe a dialogue at the end of the day and i think it certainly does that and i guess Maybe a question I have is, I, would you kind of encourage people to follow in your shoes and to visit Hollyhead and to experience the place? I, I certainly would. There's a fantastic, well, newish bridge um, connecting the port and the town, um, again, partly EU funded. The town itself, it's worth meeting the people and talking to them. If you're going to go to one place, I suggest going to Irene Edwards' uh, fishmonger's shop at the top of the high street. It's um, it, it's a jewel of a place with duck egg blue tiles inside and a real character. I'd make, I'd make Irene the queen of Hollyhead. She's uh, way into her, I guess, 70s uh, and still running the shop uh, with some fantastic fresh fish. And she can tell you anything you want. She is Google for Hollyhead. Uh, I, I can't recommend going there highly enough. Fabulous. Thank you very much uh, again for, for joining us for the Port Stories podcast, Robert. Thank you very much for having me. Dioch eto i Rob. Many thanks again to Rob. A reminder that you can follow the link in the show notes to see the images from Hollyhead Sea Change that we discussed in this podcast. You can follow Rob on Twitter at Robs001. You'll also find him on Instagram, and his website is at wtgphoto.com. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Port Stories. Your host was me, Jonathan Evershed, and sound engineering was by James Smith. We'll be back soon with more stories from our five ports in the Irish Sea Basin. Rosslare, Dublin, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock.